The Man at Arms is maybe a class that doesn't often pop out at you, but is definitely a class we cannot ignore for its uses against bosses and sometimes his versatility against regular enemies in dungeons. His appearance of lack of damage may turn you off, however he can still do a decent amount of damage while also being one of the only two people in the game who can offer the ability the to repost. Falls. His repost may not do that much damage, but still very useful based on the other skills he does have and you will see where repost can be very useful. The Man at Arms can be a damage role, can certainly be a tank role, and he can also be a mass utility role with a couple of his abilities. A Man at Arms is also pretty versatile in positioning, therefore he can be 4th to 1st, and we'll look at a certain trinket and how that can transform him into a totally different character depending on what you like in your dungeons. For his background. The Man at Arms is a seasoned veteran of combat and has been rewarded for his toil with haunting guilt and stoic resilience in equal measure. Immovable, commanding, and focused, the Man at Arms breaks down enemy lines with his mace, buckler, and furious battle cries. Before we go further, we are going to look at the armor and weapons of the Man at Arms so you have an idea of where all this space damage, crit, and speed will be coming from. So he's got his bludgeon 8 to 14, it's about average, critical percent, 6%, and speed of 5. It's uh, The speed's kind of low, but we can maybe talk about increasing that, or maybe certain situations where a speed of 5 actually isn't the worst. Then you have the bulwark, which is a dodge of 25, which is actually a little low. It's not bad, but it's not great either. An HP of 55, which is very good, very tanky individual. Hence why, once you combine him with a couple of his abilities, he has almost an infinite health pool depending on how you look at it. So we're going to go into the ability Crush as his first ability here. Accuracy of 105, once again, that's pretty much the average across all heroes. And 9% critical modifier at the max level with no other bonuses, that is a 15%, which isn't too bad. One out of eight, you'll take it for someone who really isn't geared towards damage too, too much. What's really nice about Crush is you do have to use it in positions one and two on your side. But you do have that option of hitting the third position, which is usually a stress damage dealer, or at least a utility person in the enemy lineup. And he doesn't really do weak damage. As we said, it's pretty average. Therefore, it's actually a pretty good third row position hitting ability. You should heavily consider this if you're going to use him as a damage dealer. Because this is really only one out of his three abilities to damage, and it's definitely his highest damaging ability. Thus, Crush would obviously be a thing you pick almost all the time. Rampart. Rampart has a lot going on, so we are going to break it down a little bit piece by piece here and talk about the things we think is really good, and we'll talk about the things that are eh, maybe somewhat negligible, but there's really not a lot in there that's not good, I'll say, or at least not important to this ability. So it is melee, but the great thing about it is it can be used in positions 1 to 3, which makes it a good stun, because it is a stun if you go to the bottom, which is probably why you're going to put it on. But we also cannot ignore the knock back and forward, which we'll talk about. But it does only hit positions 1 and 2, and that's actually not a terrible thing. The reason why that's not terrible is you can knock position 2 to position 3 and have position 3 become position 2. And as I say a million times, position 3 is often a very high position to kill. You might have like a leper, you might have a crusader sitting in number 1, and then you have your man at arms rampart into position 2 or 1 maybe, still keeping the leper in position 1 or 2. However you, however you want to do it. And now suddenly you have that third position into the first two rows where they can smash that position. So that is a viable strategy. Accuracy of 110, it is five above what I would call average, so that's pretty good. Damage modification of only negative 60%. That's actually not terrible for a stun chance. This can be a pretty high crit, depending on if you give your guy damage buffs or if he gets buffed up by other people. Critical modifier of 9%, once again, it's not the highest, but if you do give them increased melee crit trinkets, obviously light level will determine which kind of criticals you get. Other party members battle battled with the Jester. Obviously that can be higher, but a 15% chance is pretty good on one out of every eight, and you'll, you'll take that on your stun, especially since the damage isn't too, too low. And then obviously we get to stun, 140% base chance, it's pretty good. I'm not going to go too much in depth about that, but the good thing is since you can do damage, you can get a critical, and that could kick up to 160%. Bellow. Bellow's a weird one. I really wasn't a fan of Bellow. Then I started using it a couple of times, and I can really see how this could ruin parties by the second round. It's definitely we gotta wait for it ability. So let's just break through it. 
any position on your side hits everyone on the enemy side. Those are some pretty strong arguments for the ability already, and we'll keep going. Accuracy in 110, once again, 5 AC above, pretty darn good. Damage modification, obviously this isn't hurting anyone, so that, that is something to consider. And now we have the minus 10 dodge, which is pretty good. But the biggest thing is minus 7 speed. That practically ruins anyone's day. Enemies got a speed of 14, suddenly got a speed of 7. That's like down to all of yours. And the speed of 14 is high. Usually speeds of like 10s, 12s, and 14s are what we call pretty high. You can reduce those to 5s and 7s. And suddenly you're on the mana arms level of speed. And the mana arms, in my opinion, is about average to lower on speed. So suddenly you drop them to your speed and make it easier to hit. Therefore, Cult of Switches, Mad Men, the Royal Bone Cur Couriers, all those guys, the hags down in the weld, I mean, everyone becomes significantly easier to hit. Even Viragos now, I'm pretty sure they have a high debuff, but I'm just saying, individuals with 40 plus dodge suddenly become 30 and might go set, like, mill the pack now based on that 7 speed. It's excellent. And this ability would be particularly strong in surprises. And the reason why it's really strong in surprises is. All of you get to go already, therefore you're not really caring about the speed of the enemy at that point because you get in all your shots. Therefore, if you can minus the 7 speed of the enemy while they're surprised, they'll take their actions as normal. But typically that next round, if you get surprises and you don't kill anyone, you might take like 6 to 7 attacks in a row. Well, Bello pretty much assures you that that's not going to happen because of the fact that a couple of those individuals are going to have minus 7 speed. Therefore, you really set them up to get hammered twice in a row, because A of the minus dodge and B of the minus speed. It's very good, and then at the end there it says crits received plus 5% while marked. If you want to try to pair that up, I guess go for it, but I don't really think that's the strong aspect of Bello. It might be a good side aspect depending on your party, but I really think you're getting all your money out of the speed and dodge debuff. Defender. This ability is very bland, but oh so useful in certain boss fights. 30% protection, you protect any ally. 30% protection is a lot, and depending on the other quirks, trinkets you may have on the man arms, this could buff him to 40 to 50% within your first turn. And if you're wondering how does that work, well we'll look at a trinket where he gets 10% protection, and there's obviously quirks out there that give you 10% protection already. Having 50% raw resistance out to get go and defending someone who's squishier in your party could easily turn the battle in your favor not to spoil anything but this guy is especially good at certain levels in the darkest dungeon and also one uh event boss i'll call it. it he can just absolutely tank things so if you ever need someone to tank heavy hits wink wink use the mana arms it's just phenomenal this ability is very good and it's even better because it can be used from any position so it's not limiting to your party. Retribution. Retribution is the re repost ability so that's all that at the bottom. We'll go through that and kind of talk about it. Accuracy 105, damage modification negative 75%. This is on the first hit not the repost as we'll see. Crit modifier of pretty much 7% so we're looking at about 13% critical chance. It can be used positions 1 to 3 on your side and hit positions 1 to 3 on the enemy side. Once again, I usually hit the third position because a lot of HP and also higher protection sit in the first two. Thus, with the minus 75% protection already, it's usually not going to get a kill shot. Now, what we're looking at here is the repost. The repost damage is negative 20%. Therefore, with no additional damage buffs, I believe that takes you about to... 6 to 12 ish if you have other stuff on it'll be higher or lower but for the most part it'll be 6 to 12. That's still pretty gar darn good depending on what you want to do. Then there's a repost of plus 4% crit that's still pretty good because once again these are going to be times where you shouldn't even be attacking and you are so you always take those opportunities. Obviously it activates repost you know what repost is and here's the weird thing which can be good and definitely terrible it marks you. There may actually be times you want to mark yourself. Or if you have an Arbalist Musketeer, anyone who can clear mark or transfer mark, it might be a viable strategy because you can do it, then remove it if you're scared. And enemies that benefit from the marks such as Fungal Crawlers and Scratchers and obviously Cultist Brawlers where they can rend the mark. Also the Carrions and the Warns can be pretty freaking hard on you with marks. So you do have to be careful, but here's the thing. 
If you have a party member who's just absolutely eating crap or is might even be on death's door and you got two cultist brawlers left, use retribution because it might trigger the game to attack him twice rather than chancing it on someone who's already hurt. Because often, and not always because I have had this, you know, not always go for me, they'll attack the individual who's marked over the individual who's not. So you can essentially soak in people, say like, hey, attack me, attack me, right? So not only do you get to repost, you save your ally, then honestly, if you use this with Defender, boom, you're taking half damage, you're reposting and saving an ally all in one. It's beautiful. I would argue an obvious strategy with Retribution is Defender, because what you do is essentially you already ask for more attacks to go against you, and then you fill in another spot where you can Retribution. This is also always good against people such as Fusiliers, because they can get reposed on their Shrapnel Blast. Command. Command's a weird one, it's kind of like a cheap battle ballad. It has many of the same effects as battle ballad, the accuracy, the critical chance. Instead of gaining speed, you're going to gain 25% damage while guarded, and the reason why I don't really like that is because you essentially have to either command and then guard, or guard and then command, and I feel like that's not really utilizing the mana arms to its best ability to get that 25% while guarded. Don't get me wrong, the accuracy and 8% critical is amazing for any position, and that's why I would use it first. If it just so happens you're guarding someone, yeah, they get that damage as well. I will argue though, often I'm not defending my highest damage dealer, I am defending someone such as Utility or the main course of heals because I believe they are more important than the damage dealer because they will keep my people alive. Thus, they're not really going to be doing damaging abilities, that is my only not concerned, but warning about this ability with that damage increase while guarding. As I said, don't worry about the damage aspect of this ability. It usually doesn't come into fruition, and I wouldn't target using this. If you really want to give someone increased damage, consider someone like a Plague Doctor, where it does damage and speed for the battle, rather than this odd while you're guarding, not guarding scenario. Because the Mana Arm has so many good abilities that you're going to want to use those over just going between Command and, obviously, Defender. And finally, but definitely not least, is Bolster. Bolster is amazing, and it can essentially break the game depending on the uh, DLCs you have and how many Mana Arms you have. And the reason why I say it can break the game is the plus 10 dodge is essentially going to break the game. Now, often this is only obviously one use per battle, lasts the whole battle, and the minus 20% stress is so amazing. This ability is often great for a setup. Like, if you, you know, if this one to be the first thing you do, so you reduce stress and damage for the whole fight, I do that sometimes. Sometimes I struggle. I go, do I bellow or do I bolster? Because do I take the chance of doing the debuff? Because if the debuff fails, I've done nothing. And this is a surefire way of saying, I'm going to get the buff. And also, Bellow doesn't decrease like accuracy or damage, and this can essentially help you save damage or reduce stress that comes in. And the reason why this can break the game is if you have Colors of Madness, there's an, there's an item you can bring into dungeons. It's not like you have to find it. It's not a character. It's a physical item that will refresh battle abilities. So what I mean by that is uses per battle. In the extreme situation, three mana arms and suddenly you use three bolsters. Last plus 30 dodge, minus 60% stress now. It doesn't work like that exactly for the stress, but we're just going to say that for now. You, you would argue 30 dodge in one battle is already pretty good. That puts you at 55 dodge with no light buff or other trinkets. Well, you give each one of those men at arms one of those items, suddenly you have plus 60 dodge and minus 120% stress. Once again, it's not how the stress works, but I'm just saying. Plus 60 dodge with light level and a couple of trinkets will easily put you at a 80 to 100 dodge. It essentially breaks the game for that fight, which means you can almost cheese every boss in the game by doing this. I wouldn't recommend doing it because I think it kind of ruins the fun, but if you for some reason cannot defeat a boss, you bolster, bolster, and then you mace bash and retribution a boss to death because they can't hit you, and now you're posting all of their attacks, and then you can attack for it, yada yada. It gets broken, but the ability by itself with one use is still very strong, and I highly recommend it to have it on for any support mana arms because it can also be used in any row, thus a perfect fourth position ability. We're going to look at three trinkets, and I am tr and I try to avoid boss trinkets because if you haven't killed the boss yet or you don't want boss trinkets ruined, I don't want to say that, but there is a couple of good boss trinkets that could also work on the mana arms, but we are going to look at three trinkets you can definitely get without killing bosses. 
And the first one we're going to take will actually transform almost the entirety of the Man at Arms and how you play him. As I've been saying, Man at Arms isn't a, exactly a strong damage dealer, but often you have at least a Mace Bash or Retribution on. Well, this item will essentially force you to be just complete support, and I mean like zero damage, complete support. And that is the Guardian's Shield. Man at Arms only, very rare, 10% protection in 4th position, 50% healing received 4th position, 10 dodge 4th position. What this essentially does says, hey, I'm going to be the rock in the back, not the front, and I'm going to guard people, I'm going to bolster the party, I'm going to bellow the other side, I mean, whatever have you. I'm going to command and defend, you know? That's what this guardian shield essentially is. It is the shield for your party. You go, you know what? Let me be the rock, and I will save all of you either by decreasing the enemy party stats, increasing our stats, saving you if you're low on health, or giving us more accuracy and crit to kill the enemy quicker. It's a great item, really transforms the mana arms, takes you out of your comfort zone if you rely on everyone to do damage. Book of Sanity, it's really simple, but here's the thing, the mana arms is going to be probably defending people at one point. Thus, he's going to be taking extra stress attacks, he's going to be taking extra melee attacks, which means criticals might be coming his way. He's going to need things to reduce stress, because if he gets critical, he's going to get stress. And if you bolster and have this, you're going to reduce a lot of stress coming in, because he might even take horror ability, and it'll take stress on a per round basis. Thus, anytime you can reduce stress you're taking, it's going to be excellent, because then you won't have to take a turn to heal stress off of him because he's getting so high. He can tank all the damage and keep his stress low, and then you can heal him, which is one turn rather than healing him and reducing stress. And the focus ring's kinda out there. The focus ring's really good on a lot of heroes, and the reason why I'm not too worried about the eight dodge on him is because A, he can increase the dodge of the party, thus he kinda cancels this effect out. So if you can tell me I can get plus two dodge, minus 20% stress, 10 accuracy, and five crit, I'd take it, right, on your first turn, and that's what the Focus Ring essentially does. There's other melee increasing damage trinkets you can do, and accuracy trinkets if you want. I just think the Focus Ring is great for repost because it'll make sure your repost lands, also adds some of that extra critical, and really the 8 dodge isn't detrimental because he has 55 HP, so anytime you get him more HP or reliable healer, he's just not going to die, so don't be afraid to let him take some additional damage. And finally, we'll go through all of his camping abilities. He has some really strong camping abilities, and some are for the whole party and some are for himself, and I'll kind of give my overall view of which ones I think you should use in parties and which ones I think you can pass on. Maintain equipment. For a time cost of 4, for only 15% protection, 15% damage, I'm going to have to give that a solid no. It's a time cost of 4. If they squeaked it down to maybe 3... I would argue this should actually be probably a 2, because 15% protection really doesn't do all that much. I mean, you could have 25% with a quirk or a trinket, which is pretty good. And 15% damage based on the mana arms base damage actually isn't a lot. That might bump you up to like 9 and 15. That's not that great. If you're lucky, it's 10 and 16, which is still pretty good, but not for a time cost of 4. Tactics. Tactics for a time cost of 4. A, it's for the party. Awesome. Plus 10 dodge for everyone is just amazing. And then plus 5 crit. No RNG chance here, just a straight 10 dodge, 5% crit. You end the battle, you bolster. So then you have plus 20 dodge. That's crazy. You have 20 dodge from the first turn with an extra 5% critical. I think it's an absolute must if you need a campfire ability. Instruction. Time cost of 3, 1 companion, 10 accuracy, 3 speed. I don't think it's bad in the early game if, you know, if this is one of the randomly selected campfire abilities for you. I wouldn't say no to it because it is definitely one of the better ones for a time cost of three. And certain individuals, such as a, a leper who is slow, or if you need a back row person to go first and hit, it might be really good for them. Because really, plus three speed to anybody is really good. So even if you want to put this on a highwayman so you can start with a grape shot blast to set up the rest of your party to do crits. That would also be another great viable strategy, and there's really not one situation I want to say this should go on somebody. There's a lot of people, depending on how your party works, that this ability could go on. And finally, we get the weapons practice, a time cost of four, all companions, once again. So this is not to party, this is all companions, which means this will leave out the mana arms. There's a difference between all companions and party, and we'll go back through that again. 
So party, the man at arms gets this as well, and then all companions will get 10% damage, plus 75% chance to get 8% critical. I think weapons practice and tactics are very good hand in hand. It gives you damage, crit, dodge, and some more crit. You can get essentially, if you're lucky, all your companions can get 13% critical, 10 dodge, and 10% damage for a time cost of 8. And then what you can do is you can pick a campfire ability that will reduce your midnight ambush to obviously 0% chance, and suddenly you're going to get a better surprise chance maybe, depending on the campfire ability. And then you got the damage, you got the dodge, and you got the crit. It's just amazing abilities. The Man of Arms may not be a class a lot of people like, and often I sometimes see people like, you know, I just couldn't, I couldn't bring up a Man of Arms. They just didn't have the damage, and it, it's sad to see because I was that way too. My first run through, man, did I not like Man of Arms, because once again, I loved me some Leper's Crusaders, Highwaymen, Vessels, yada yada. You, you know this field if you watch this channel long enough. You know. But they're really just so good. The the amount of utility they offer, the amount of camping skills they offer, the amount of bosses and dungeons they can allow you to excel in and not make you scratch your head because they go, I will be the rock in your formation. Nothing will kill me. I can increase your party's chance to dodge. And if you really want to cheat, I can break the game with multiples. I mean, not many characters can say that. Except for maybe like plague doctors with a leper and you know doing the and doing the colors of madness cheese. But I really do think you should have at least two at mana arms in your roster. It's just they're so versatile. And they can honestly do a decent amount of damage if you want them to be that character. Their retribution helps you kill people with a repost, and their mace bash has a good versatility for not too low of damage. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you think of the mana arms, and I'll see you around.